This is Mark Guerrero. Welcome to East LA Music Stories, episode 13, Lucky 13. And my guest is trumpet player Tom Bray, who was a member of the Evergreen Blues in the late 60s and Elijah in the early 70s. It was kind of the same group that just changed their name, evolved. And uh, a few days ago, I had another member of those two bands, Hank Barrio, on. And uh, he told the story of the group, but then he told the story of his post Elijah career. And we're going to do the same thing with uh, Tom, because after Elijah, he took a different fork in the road, so to speak. So uh, how you doing, Tom? Welcome. Pretty good. How you doing, Mark? Good. So the band, as it, uh, the very beginning of the band started at San Alfonso's Elementary School, Catholic School, and uh, Hank Barrio, Manny Esparza, Sam Lombardo, and Joe McSwain went there. And they right. started to play together and form a band. And uh, eventually, you and two other guys were going to Montebello High School, I think, right? And joined up with them. How did the, you guys put your things together? Well, I think uh, Steve was the first uh, guy to get in with the two-thirds majority. Steve Lawrence? The band. And, uh, Steve Lawrence. Steve Lawrence, yes. Steve Otis Lawrence, he used to go by. Otis. Name. <laughs> Otis was his father's name, so he took his father father's name as his middle name, and uh, he he used to play uh, Farfisa organ with the two thirds majority. And then at some point, uh, they wanted to add uh, you know a trumpet and trombone, and Steve was a great sax player, so he could do like a double time thing and playing both organ and uh, tenor sax. So we were lucky enough to get in with the guys in uh, high school. Let me read uh, in. When we were juniors in high school, I think the Horns joined the band and we would play some good uh, concerts and stuff. Were you guys in the school band at Montebello? Oh, definitely. Yeah. In fact, my senior year, I was president of the Montebello High School marching band. Woo. Oh, big time, man. <laughs> nice. So you guys joined up with the other guys. And at first you were called the two thirds majority. Right. And, yeah. And uh, you started playing around East L.A. And what kind of gigs did you do? Mostly at that time, it was either at Cantwell High School or Montebello High School. And it was good that uh, we had the other guys going to Cantwell because we had connections at both uh, both high schools. So, uh, Well, I mentioned, was... I mentioned to Hank yesterday that my band, which at that time I believe was called the Men From Sound, uh, we were yeah. on the bill with two-thirds majority at Cantwell High School way back in probably 66 maybe. Yeah. That's yes, so it's funny. funny. Because, you know, the Los Angeles Parks and Recreation people, they had this thing going on in 1960, well, 65, 66, and 67. And it was for school dance bands and also other dance bands, like 15-piece dance band thing. And we put a dance band together in 67. We were also competing in the high school dance band category. But then we had another dance band that we put together with great musicians. And I called the band the band from sound. So really? I sold your idea, yeah. Oh my God, I need some little, <laughs> few pennies of royalties. Hey, man, that's a compliment. Though. <laughs> okay, well, I didn't know that, a little tidbit. Yeah. So um, so once you guys became a two-third majority, you played around. You must have started playing other places because Hank was mentioning you played some of the East LA circuit, maybe some of those gigs, San Alfonso oh. Auditorium. Yeah, yeah, it, it was so much fun back yeah. in those days. And yeah. you guys were the first band that I knew uh, locally that got a, a major record deal with, it was with Mercury Records. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, and, and then at that point you changed your name to the Evergreen Blues. Hank seemed to yeah. think it was the record company's idea or do you know how the name happened and how the deal happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, I am, now that I think about it, as far as the, the name, the Evergreen Blues, I am not exactly sure where that orig originated. If it was out of the, the from the Jim King uh, catalog of musical whatever ideas, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad we we hit on that and we did two albums as the Evergreen Blues. First one, one first on Mercury. One on Mercury, yeah, and that. that Let's talk about that one before we get on to the next one. Better so good. on that album, uh, you recorded one of your manager's songs that he had written. And that was Midnight Confessions. Mm -hmm. And your manager was named Jimmy King, but he also went by the name L.T. Josie right. as a songwriter. 
Now, Hank seemed to think that L.T. Josie was his real name and Jimmy King was the uh, pseudonym. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds that sounds right. Just Jimmy King, you know, yeah. Don King. You yeah. got all B.B. King was the best. A lot of King. <laughs> yeah. But um, so then you guys came up with that arrangement. Talk about that, how you guys came up with that arrangement. How about the arrangements for what? I'm sorry. Uh, Midnight, Midnight Confessions. Oh, yeah, we did. Uh, uh, all the horn arrangements were done by myself, Kenny, and Steve. Although, no, I've got to backtrack on that. Steve didn't play on the horn parts on Midnight Confessions. The, it was the, the trumpet and trombone. He played the and, Parfisa uh, organ, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but uh, Hank was really good in the studio. I mean, he really, he stepped right into his element there when... Uh, when we would record, like I remember doing the stuff at uh, United Western Studios, I believe it was, and we were playing the, you know, we would do the middle horn part. And then immediately after doing the original takes, we would go back and overdub the horns and the, the harmonies. And you had to do it really quick as far as we were concerned because it, it was uh, the best for intonation. You wanted uh, everything in tune and you had the feel, you know, it was good. So you had uh, Steve Lawrence on that little uh, Farfisa organ. And of course, mm -hmm. a lot of bands had Farfisas at the time. That was the standard because yeah, that's all there was. At later, people got Vox organs, which was the next step yeah, up. Right. And then Hammond organs eventually. But that yeah. little cheesy uh, Farfisa, you know, of course, 96 Tears, uh, uh, Wooly Bully, all those records have Farfisas on them. Mm -hmm. but, um, um, Anyway, you guys did this incredible arrangement. You must have worked it out, not just the horns, but the guys in the band came up, you know, the bass line, that great Joe uh, McSwain bass line uh, and, and Manny's vocal. I mean, the thing, it was a great arrangement. And um, and uh, oh. what happened after that? <laughs> <Let's>... <laughs> yeah, but, you know, uh, I think the driving force of our original Midnight Confessions was uh, uh, Sammy and Joe. We had, you know, Sammy just punching out on the drums. Joe was what I would call um, playing bass uh, on that song is more applies to like a lead bass yeah. because he's doing, he's very busy. He's like his cousin, Jimmy Espinosa, you know, the Midnight. They're both great, but it's a different style that, yeah, I mean, it's always moving. Yeah. It, it, it worked. And uh, I, I hear the difference between our arrangement and then the one that the grassroots did because it didn't have the, they didn't have the energy, even though they used the best musicians in Hollywood doing that. They, used the, they did the same parts, but it didn't have the same kind of soul and, and oomph to it, power to yeah, it. Yeah, right. A, a while back, I checked on, the, you know, Hal Blaine had something on his website. He's passed a few years yes. ago, but uh, he had all of the musicians that played on Midnight Confession. Oh, really? Yes, and he had they, they had like three or four trumpet players, a couple of trombone players. <laughs> I was flattered. I thought, wow, they, it took all of that to re reproduce what we did, you know. Yeah, I know Hal Blaine played drums on it. I did one session with uh, my first single was Hal Blaine and Joe Osborne on bass. I wonder if it was Joe <laughs> Osborne. You don't remember on the bass? You don't know who played bass on the grassroots version? Uh, it might be Joe Osborne. Yes, and I'm uh, thinking. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, or Carol King. Was that her name? The Carol K. K, that's right, Carol K. It would have been one of those uh, Wrecking Crew people. But that's another yeah. thing I brought up with Hank is that a lot of people didn't know in those days that a lot of bands like like uh, Grassroots, Early Birds, the later Beach Boys. Right. They, they had the Wrecking Crew, and people it what, didn't say that on the album. So people assumed, oh, that's the birds playing on Mr. Tambourine Man. And it wasn't. Exactly. You know, right. Um, the, the Beach Boys used a lot of that. Yeah. Too. Like I said, uh, I give them credit because their early records, they were playing on those early Surf and Safari. But once they got to Good Vibrations and Heroes and Villains and Pet Sounds, it was the Wrecking Crew. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, whereas the other band started with the Wrecking Crew and like the birds later played on their own records. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the Beach Boys, it was the opposite. But anyway, I like, got. We East LA people, we played ourselves, baby. We had no exactly choice. Exactly right. You know, we didn't even know that could exist. Yeah. It was offered to us. Really? Uh, the time I did it is because I was a solo artist. I didn't have a band, so it made sense. So that record came out. The grassroots singer sang on it, I guess. And it came mm -hmm. out as a record by the grassroots. And it became yeah. a huge national hit. How did you guys feel when that happened? Especially because uh, they took your arrangement. It, well, I mean, uh, it's... It's hard to say. The, the, the most insulting thing 
that happened was they they're on their record label uh, on the label of the 45 itself you know it said midnight confessions horns arranged by jimmy haskell that is a flat out lie i wanted to sue him and uh but we were young and our the manager of the band uh, you know jim king he wrote the song he was so happy that they did it of because course. he was going to make big bucks but we had a, a contract with jim king uh, we had to sign it before we went on Mercury Records and on tour and everything. And our parents had to okay this thing because we were all young. And the judge at the time asked us, have you, have any of you guys read this contract? Do you know what this says? And we didn't. We didn't have a lawyer or anything. We just wanted to, you know, jump into the big time. And uh, the judge was saying that he has total control over everything you do as a group and as individuals. So even if I wanted to sue uh, Jimmy Haskell, I probably couldn't at the time because uh, he had complete uh, legal uh, you know, authority. But uh, how did you feel? Did some of the guys feel pissed off? I, I, what was the thing? Yeah. Yeah, I think pissed off was probably it. I mean, and some people might think you might feel flattered. They took that song and it got to, I think, number two in, on Billboard. Uh, but just the feeling that they just took it away from us yeah. in that regard. So. It would have been different if they did their own complete arrangement. Fine. But they just took the, the carbon copy. Yeah. You guys could have had the hit. So that's mm -hmm. how you guys started your career with that. You know, nice. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to showbiz. showbiz. There you go. No yeah. Vaseline, no Vaseline included. No, exactly right. You know, <laughs> uh -huh. gosh. So it, it was a hell of a lesson for us, you know, right in the beginning like that. But uh, that's so it. Let, so let's talk about this song we have in common that I found out about the other day. Was three's a crowd? Yeah, right. So the way it happened. So, so the same guy, LT Josie, aka Jimmy King, wrote a song called Three's a Crowd." Coincidentally, my band, which at that point was called 1984, All in, right. the year, in the year 1969, we had a band called 1984, named after the George Orwell book. Right. And um, so we were recording for Cap K A P P Records, an MCA label, and our engineer was Tommy Coe. Who happened right. to engineer your album? Yes, he was a good guy. Yeah, great guy. We loved him. Yeah. So, so, uh, so Tommy Coe engineered your Three's a Crowd. I think he engineered, he, he may, I'm not sure if he engineered Strange Brew's Three's a Crowd. Right. But our friend Strange Brew, Ronnie Reyes and Art Sanchez and those yeah, guys. Yeah, Gomer on bass. So yeah. Yeah, Gomer, Art Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they recorded it too. So, three of us recorded the same song. Wow. And, I, and I'm assuming that, uh, that Tommy Coe got the song from Jimmy King on his own, you know, having done it with you. But all I know is we were presented with it. We got a brand new record deal and our manager, Stan Silver, and Tommy Coe said, hey, record this. You know, this, this is what you're going to record. Yeah. So um, my song was on the B side that I had written. And so here was my first big opportunity to sing on a major label. And I said, I don't want to sing that song. I, I just want to sing songs that I write. I don't want to be known as a, a cover yeah. singer. I want, to, I want to be a singer songwriter of my own right. So I had our drummer, Ernie Hernandez, sing it. And he sang it great. He did a great job, but I didn't want to sing it. So when yeah. I interviewed Hank the other day, he said, oh my God, our lead singer, Manny, didn't want to sing it either. And right. Steve Lawrence sang it. Yeah, he handed it off to Steve. Yeah, so both of us handed it off. Yeah. You kick this hot football. Um, and uh, I thought it was hilarious that Manny didn't want to sing it either. So, but oh, yeah, all three of us recorded it, and uh -huh. all our versions are different. But uh, Steve, Steve did a real good job on it. Uh, but the, the words in the beginning, you know, hey, looky here, you're taking me for some kind of fool. It, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> coming out Who strong. Yeah, but anyway. the, you're coming out strong, but the things you're saying ain't so cool or something like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we made a really good record of it. It sounded like a hit to me. It was really great. We had a big time trumpet player come in, one of the top studio guys, and Tommy Coe brought in to play some right. trumpet on. You'll have to hear it sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we didn't get any promotion. You guys didn't get any promotion. Strange we didn't get any promotion. Yeah. Nothing happened. It's kind of funny that we all did it. Yes, yeah, we were lucky with Mercury Records because they put a lot of money into the Evergreen Blues, gave us a private plane on our East Coast tour. Wow, geez. I mean, it was the same, same kind of plane that Otis Redding went down 
in uh, Lake Erie, was it? Uh, just a couple of months before we went on tour back in 1968. And you guys were on that plane on, on the same yeah. lake. You guys were freaking out in the fog. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I remember <laughs> Joe getting sick on the plane. He had a bag. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys got, yeah, we didn't get a tour. We didn't get, we didn't get squat. But um, <laughs> what did you think about the rest of the album? Hank thought that the rest of the album wasn't very good. Did you think there was anything else worthwhile on the record? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, not, not really. We didn't. We weren't able to spend enough time, I think, on it. Uh, we had a really, a, a really tight band, and it, nobody. I don't, we were all pretty much the same caliber of musicians at the time, right out of high school. And it, uh, God, I'm trying to even remember some of those songs. I think we did try a little tenderness. Well, I think wasn't that on the second album? I think that was. It might have been the yeah, yeah. it might have been the ABC. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna get to that story too. Okay. But anyway, according to Hank, you guys put all the time into Midnight Confessions. It was pretty good, and everything else he thought was pretty crappy. He he, would, yeah. I mean, he went further than he said. Oh, that, it wasn't very good. We weren't very experienced yet. But you made a good point about you guys were all at the same level because I mean I watched you guys develop, and you guys all started out at the same time and same caliber, and you kept getting better and better and tighter and tighter and better till you wound up on Elijah, incredibly fantastic. That was a I think it's a right. masterpiece, masterpiece album. But you guys grew together and got great together, and like Hank said, you rehearsed a lot, right? Yeah, and uh, I believe that was the. Uh... 1972, 73, when Elijah. we did the United United Artists album. That's the album. We, we had a, a good producer, Doug Gilmore and Terry Furlong, right. produced the band. And they really brought out the best in the group, I, I think. Yeah, but you guys were experienced by then, too. But let's not jump ahead of the game here. We got to go back to... Uh, okay. Uh, I want to go back to the ABC thing. So you, you did a tour, right? 18 City Tour on mm -hmm. the first album. Yeah. Any any stories about that? Anything you remember about that besides the Otis Redding plane and all that? Uh, stories about the tour? Yeah, anything interesting or just oh, a lot of cities? Well, you guys were young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I remember at one point we were uh, had to get up really early to load the van, and you know we would do all the, we didn't have any roadies or anything like that. We would do all the work ourselves, and at one point uh, we're at like at a loading dock at a hotel or something. And Manny, uh, as we're picking up stuff, Manny says, hey, you see, we're doing all this shit. Where's the big man? And he's talking about Jim King, AKA <laughs> Lou Josie. And Lou Josie's just coming, walking on into the you know area. And he goes, here I am. And Manny Whoa. just looked at him and said, it's about time, you know? <laughs> I mean, we're just, we're just feeling our, you know, what's going on, you know? And it's, uh, Coming Manny, of age. Esparza, Manny Esparza, the lead singer, he was, he, he was great. And he got, by the time of the Elijah album, he was fantastic. Yeah. But anyway, so then how did you guys wind up on ABC? And I'm assuming that the Mercury deal kind of fell through after the tour. Right. Uh, so you must have been free to make another deal. And you wound up at ABC Records. Was yeah. Jimmy King still working with you guys at that point on ABC? God, that's, uh, I, I believe he was at that point. And then uh, after the ABC uh, record, you know, came out and didn't do much for us, uh, when we changed the name to Elijah, I think that's when we got our that when our you got your supply. got your freedom, yeah. yeah. But uh, while we're on the uh, ABC album, um, that was the one I think that had "Try a Little Tenderness." As a matter of fact, I have it right here. There you are. So All let right. me see All if right, it's Mark. on here. It is on this album. With uh, there's a song called "The Moon Is High" and so am I. The moon is high. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> moon is high and so am I. I'm gonna get to you tonight. Uh, I'm feeling no pain. Your loss will be my gain. I'm getting to you tonight. Poetry in motion, baby. Yes, yeah, right. Kenny, Kenny Walter. And here's here's the back. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so you guys recorded sort of a rock version of "Try a Little, Try a Little Tenderness," and uh, Otis Redding had done an R&B version that you guys liked and. You did your version of it. And then right. shortly thereafter, Three Dog Night did it. And you guys actually opened for Three Dog Night and also recorded at Richie Podler's studio that produced Three Dog Night. So do you right. think there was a connection with that maybe Three Dog Night got the idea of doing a rock version of it from you guys? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. That makes, makes sense to me. So let's mention that about uh, American Studios. So we have this connection too. Totally separate. You know, had, we had nothing to do with each other at the time. Right. Had the same connection for some reason. So when you guys recording, were recording this album at American Studios in Studio City, owned by Richard Podler, who was, right. the, who was the producer of Steppenwolf and Three Dog Night at the time. Very hot producer. Had his own mm -hmm. studio. Well, we did our first cap single um, at American with Tommy Coe. And uh, that's when we did our Three's a Crowd version. And you guys were recording there probably around the same time uh, yeah. with Tommy Coe also at American. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was another coincidence. It's just, uh, you know, it's yeah. just, with all the studios in town, all the engineers, we had the same ones. But uh, so that's, that was a definite connection that you can, you can believe. That's where they got the idea. And that was their first major hit. Yeah. Yeah, really. So uh, you guys we were influencing a lot of people for the quid. Yeah. Yeah, it, that was a popular place. I mean, American Studios down there with, uh, uh, we met Donovan one evening. We were just finishing up uh, with a day of recording and then Donovan came into the studio to uh, record and we were all like, wow, he's a, there's a superstar there. Yeah, wow, <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. So uh, so after ABC, um, then uh, you, you guys evolved into Elijah and you got that record deal with United Artists. And how did that come about? Yeah, uh, we we got together with a guy named Doug Gilmore, who uh, he had his offices at United Western Studios right on Sunset. Mm. And I'm trying to think of exactly. Oh, I think we got together with him through a guy named uh, Terry Furlong. And Terry was a great guitar player. He had a band called the the Blue Rose Band, and he made a he made a really big record deal on his own with you know his, his group of musicians. Michael McDonald also played with, with Terry. And uh, it was Terry that put us together with Doug. And we, Doug was a great guy. He, he passed years ago, but the uh, guy was a wonderful fellow. He brought people together. He, he used to write music with Delaney Bramlett. And we all got to be friends. It, it was cool. So Terry was a connection with you guys and Delaney eventually? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, so the, the name Elijah came about as you were making the record or did you have Elijah going in? Uh, we, I think it was Manny's idea with Elijah because he was, uh, would talk about the, um, the, the reference from the Bible, right. Elijah. And, you know, Hey, think it, yeah, that's, we're all for it. It's yeah. all good. And, uh, Hank was telling me that the song Elijah, which I love, you know, Elijah needs some saving. Oh, right. Lord, send down those ravens. Uh -huh. uh, he said that you guys wrote it at the last minute. It was like an afterthought. You needed one more song, and it was kind of thrown together fast. Do you remember it that way? Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, Henry is a, a very good reference uh, for the the history of the band. <laughs> he's a historian. <laughs> yes, he is. He's he's good, solid, solid fellow. Um. Yeah. But I, I love that album. I bought it at the time. I still have it. It's right here. Wow right here okay everybody this is a great album all right the masterpiece every song is great mm -hmm. performances are great uh, vocals are great very cool and there's the inside thing with everybody oh, yeah i have that up on my wall right here. yeah <laughs> anyway, this is a great album um a friend of mine uh, i'll tell you who he is later but uh after he saw the hank show he ordered this he found it on he went on on uh, some website he found a German import. He bought a German version of this. It cost him like 35 bucks or something. Really? <laughs> wow. That's so amazing. Similar. And he found a, uh, he got a version of your version of Midnight Confessions. And another okay. single too. Cool. So see, it's opening up a can of worms here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a, it's a great album. I had it at the time. And... Uh, I love it to this day. Every time I hear it, it's great. But I particularly liked your uh, the two Redbone songs you did. You did Prehistoric yes. Rhythm and Thirteenth um, Hour. That Thirteenth Hour. Yeah. Now, do you do you recall how you met Redbone and how you wound up with the songs? I believe it was when uh, we opened for Delaney, Delaney and Bonnie at the time uh, at a a little club in uh, 
it's by uh, it's out in the valley. I think it was called the Brass Ring. Mm, and uh, yeah, we opened for them. And when they would play, everybody would come in. It, was, it wasn't that big of a place, but man, it was packed. I met Pat and Lolly Vegas there and great guys, really good people. We were very fortunate to be in that that crowd, you know. To, and had they already recorded those two songs? They had them out already? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We opened for them in Fresno. And at that time in Fresno, they were like the Beatles. They're I mean, from they Fresno. Just, That's where they're from. Yeah. Right. It was really good. It was a, a great experience. When you recorded those songs, did they know you were going to record them? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, we we loved the songs and uh, it was uh, just applying uh, the horn parts to do the other things that like the bass and the guitar were doing. There was one on 13th hour, ba -da -ba -da, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da and there was a, a fast horn line that we incorporated, uh, just trying to complement you know, what they did pretty much. Lido afterwards, when they heard the songs, they really liked what you guys did. You know, I know Pat Vegas loved it, you know. All right. Yeah, they liked it. That makes me feel very good. Yeah, you know, it, it's good to be able to take material like that from the great band like Redbone yeah. and kind of put your own spin. Yeah, exactly. You know, on it. It, it just, it was natural, you know. That's what uh, the grassroots should have done. Put their own spin. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lesson. Okay. Let that be a lesson to you. Yeah. No people kidding. out there. Then it gets interesting. Well, let's before we get beyond that, tell your story about the uh Edward James Olmos when he was your singer in your band along with Manny. That right that phase. Where did where did that fit in? Was that before the Elijah album or after the Elijah album? Oh, that before, was after, wasn't it? after 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 the Elijah. Yeah, I believe yeah. it was. Uh um, Hank wasn't sure, I think. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say because it was a strange little episode <laughs> timing there. I mean, we were heavily under the influence of Edward James almost. And, and, and other a, things, I might add. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> but he, he had a work ethic that was second to none. I mean, the guy was serious and you knew he was going to be a success at whatever he, you know, put his mind to. And, and he was great. But uh, there were times, though, that it was uh, kind of a uh, wasn't... I mean, it was like a we, he's pulling us in another direction kind of thing. And uh, uh, it's I remember a, a little bit of a problem between him and uh, and Sammy, of all people. Sammy is the most easygoing fellow you'd ever want to meet. And uh, I, at one point, I think it, I think it was Sam. It says, yeah, this is not your band, you know, because he wanted us to do this other other kind of thing. And we just parted ways, which he had a. We had an album that we put together was 10 songs, really good songs. One song on the album was called Just a Few More Days. And it was fantastic with the horn arrangements, Manny just singing his ass off. And Eddie recorded all of these songs and he put them in like, uh, I don't know, his vault or something. And he still has them. He's I never heard released. that. I heard that. I wish you would. You know, what the hell. Nice to hear him. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so he was with the band. How long would you say it was for? Like six months, a year? Yeah. Yeah. Some, maybe maybe six, seven months. It was just uh, yeah. those were crazy times. Right. At, at that time, we were rehearsing at a place called we called it Pine Lodge. It was up by Rose Hills, way up in the, you know, up, up past Rose Hills. And there was a big fire and all of our equipment, the drums, the Hammond organ, everything just went up in flames. Oh, no. Yeah. So I we know were that. at a, a really bad time. But it was, I got to give Eddie credit for getting us up from that point. Because at some point, you know, you just say, hey, this this is just not going to make it. But he brought us together at that point. Nice. Since we're in 1972, that was the first time I hired the horn section. Um, and you guys played oh, yeah. on my, my record. Yeah. When I was recording uh, an album for Capitol at the time, um, I brought you guys in for two songs. One was Nobody's Satisfied. The other one was called Hang On. And you and uh, Steve Lawrence on sax and Kenny Walder on trombone came in. Mm -hmm. Came up with some arrangements on the spot in the studio. And it's great. You know, you, they still, those tracks still exist today. I think I sent them to you recently. A couple uh, of years yeah, ago. right. But, but it was great. You guys did a great job. And then in 79, I was recording some songs and brought you guys in and you did... Uh, Two more songs with me in 79. Gotta thank the Black Men for your rock and roll. 
and I'll take rock and roll any old time. Once again, mm-hmm. you guys came up with some awesome parts. See, I, I was a good talent scout. I knew who to, who to, who to hire. <laughs> so after uh, Elijah broke up, by the way, did you tour with Elijah? On oh, the first album? gosh. I think we just, we played all over Southern California. Yeah. And in fact, when we were, uh, I believe it was in 1974, early in 74, mm-hmm. we were playing a club, club called the uh, Goose Creek Saloon uh, out in the, the valley. And while we were doing that gig, uh, Buddy Miles came into the club and he heard the band. And he, after we finished the set, I remember he was standing right by the stage and he asked our horn section, would you guys like to go with the electric flag? Uh, I got and it. Okay. Holy crap. That was, okay. you know, one of our all time favorite bands. Uh, and uh, uh, that's no. why, that's why we left Elijah. Yeah. That was going to be then my next thing. However, well, around 72, I just remembered this. Now, I did mention this on Hank's show, too, is the, the show we did together in 1972. It's El Chicano, Tierra, Mark Carrero with the Mud Brothers, Elijah, Carmen Moreno, Cal State, LA, right. Cal State, Los Angeles. Do you remember that gig out in the stadium? I think I do. Yes, yes. <laughs> you think you do. <laughs> well, I think I do. It's back you were under a certain influence. <laughs> And it wasn't just Edward James Olmos' influence. Oh, man. But no, this was a big, uh, big deal. It was great. And there, yeah. We still have some pictures of it. I think, I think Hank said he's got some pictures of you guys playing there. But we did great. that in 72. And here's a flyer where uh, my band, 1984, played with uh, Evergreen mm-hmm. Blues. You guys are headlining at the Montebello oh. Armory. All right. Back in 19, uh, I think it was 67, December 27th. Maybe 68. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, so you and Hank were in Evergreen, two thirds majority, um, Evergreen Blues, Elijah together. And -hmm. that's where you guys split off. Oh, wait. Yeah. You guys split off. Um, Most of the guys from Elijah wound up taking a record deal with um, Al Cooper. Right. And his label Sounds of the South, which was a subsidiary of MCA, I believe. Yeah. And so they went to Georgia to do a second Elijah album. And you and uh, Steve and Kenny all didn't go or. Yeah. No, Kenny stayed. Kenny stayed with Elijah. Yeah. OK. Steve the YouTube, and I, you and Steve. Yeah, yeah. We did a tour at that time. We did a tour with uh, Delaney. Delaney that was Brown. First. That was before the electric flag. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that had to be so what, how that, did the how did the well, first of all why did you guys decide not to go to Georgia? Oh, uh, I'm not sure honestly. Uh, we just we had a good rapport with Delaney, and uh, he was going out on a you know a big tour, met some great people uh, do, doing that, and we decided to just go you know go our own uh, own way with. Uh, and what about what about Kenny on the trombone? Did he consider staying with you guys and then decided to go with Elijah? Well, yeah, he, he stayed, and, and they found uh, they found two really good horn players. They got Don Roberts on sax mm-hmm. and Stu Blumberg on trumpet. Two fantastic players. So I mean, they more than, than you know fill the gap there. They mm-hmm. they did a great job. Yeah, I think you said you got hooked up with Delaney through Terry Furlong, right? And, and Doug Gilmore. And yeah. Doug Gilmore from the guys that produced the Elijah album, first mm-hmm. Elijah. Yeah. So now you join them up, and he already had his hit, uh, uh, "Never Ending Song of Love" with Delaney and Bonnie. Oh gosh, I don't. That's this was before, I believe. Yeah, before, before he wrote that song. Yeah, and uh, it's a great story about how he wrote that. Yeah, he uh, he heard his uh, his daughters were playing jump rope outside his house in Sherman Oaks at the time, and as they're doing the jump rope thing, and they got that rhythm, and they're singing songs like you know, "Step on a Crack." Break your mother's back, da da. You know all of this kind of thing, and and mm-hmm. Delaney, you know, he jumped up and he said, "What the hell are you singing?" And she goes, "Oh well, this is just a jump rope song." And he said, "Wait right here." He went in the house. Fifteen minutes later, he comes out with "Never Ending Song of Love," and the song was, uh, you know, made him millions of dollars. Yeah. But, uh, and did it did it remind him of a jump rope song? A jump rope song. <laughs> yeah. I've got a never ending love for you. It was kind of like a country song, like a two beat. Yeah. Right. It was great, great uh, job there he did. Yeah. So you guys went on the road with them. And what was that like? And by the way, was, um, what's the name of that great Hammond player that he had? 
that later was in uh, oh Eric and the Dominoes. You think of uh, uh, Bobby Woodlock? Yeah, was he in the band when you guys? No, no, he wasn't in the band at that time. I think we had a guy named uh, Mark Allen, I believe his name was. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, oh, I, I know. I remember uh, Delaney's band. He had uh, another guy by by the name of uh, Larry Grit Sabal on trombone. So Steve and I joined up with Larry, and we uh, that was our horn section. Bobby Whitlock, yeah. By then he was already in England because uh, he recorded on uh, George Harrison's All Things Must Pass around right. 1970. And then he joined Derek and the Dominoes with Eric Clapton and was with him in that period, yeah. 71, 72. So yeah, he had already left, but he mm -hmm. started with Delaney Body at the very beginning. Yes, and, and they uh, it was Leon Russell who took Delaney's band away from Delaney That's and they right. went on tour with Eric Clapton. Yes. And left Delaney with just trying to figure out which way was up. Yeah. God. <laughs> but anyway, so you guys toured, you go around the country or where'd you go on that tour? Yeah, just in the country. Yeah. I got to got to meet Jimmy Buffett, which mm. was a real treat. Before he got famous? Uh when well, we when we were at Delaney, we were down in Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, Jimmy Buffett opened for us. Oh. That was cool. <laughs> Did he already have Margaritaville by then? Uh no. That was before. No, he didn't. Wow. That's that's why he was opening. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you would have been opening. Yeah, but he was a great guy. Wonderful fellow. So you toured with Delaney and Bonnie, and then uh, how'd you hook up with Buddy Miles? You just mentioned how you met Buddy Miles at that gig. How, how did that happen later like that? I mean, yeah, that's a good did, what's yeah. the timeline on that. Mm -hmm. Well, we we got back after the guys got back for the Sounds, Sounds of the South thing. And Leonard Skinner was the biggest thing to come out of the yeah. you know, Al Cooper label. But um, we had to get back together and we're playing, you know, at that place in 74. Oh, I got it. Yeah. And then Buddy, Buddy came down and okay. liked what he heard. And, you know, there was a time right after uh, we had gotten together with when we were working with uh, Eddie Almost, uh, we were doing double gigs. We were playing like in, in Hollywood from nine to one. And then we do after hours gig from like two to five, uh, two to six in the morning. And I blew my chops out. You know, we play trumpet. You can do real damage if you use too much uh, pressure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes to stay awake, we would take uh, whatever stimulus we could find. And uh, I just, I split my lip and I was ready to quit. I believe it was 73, somewhere in there. And it was the guys in Elijah. I remember Sammy and Hank, and Joe and Manny. They, they found this trumpet teacher down at Corona Del Mar. His name was Harold Mitchell. We used to call him Paplin Pappy Mitchell because he was like 74 years old and a great guy. And they said, you should go see this guy because they knew how I felt. I just felt like I didn't have a life anymore. And so I went down every week, was taking lessons from him and got my chops back together. But it was those guys, you know, who pointed me in the right direction. So God oh, bless nice. them. Yeah. So uh, you went on tour with uh, the Electric Flag? Mm-hmm. It was you, Steve, and Kenny. Was Kenny involved in that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We we did the we we're working on an album called The Band Kept Plan was the the album that they released in 1974 with Michael Bloomfield on guitar wow. and Buddy Miles and drums and uh Nick Rabinitis vocals. It was a great band. Wow. So you played with those guys on tour too, including uh, yeah. Michael Bloomfield? Mm -hmm. Wow, what a great guitar player. That must have been. That's right. Uh, well, the, to explain how really good this band was, they had a record deal back in 74 to our first record was released on uh, Atlantic. And then the next record would be released on Columbia. So we had two uh, the biggest record labels that were going at the time. And we were supposed to just, you know, knock it out of the park. But then the guys, they could not get along. Well, uh, we found out later that we had guys in the band bringing guns to rehearsals. <laughs> Honestly, and that was a shocking uh, realization of what was going on there. And so they just, uh, you know, they couldn't work together. So do you we remember, stayed with do you remember who the who the hosti hostility was between? Was Michael Bloomfield involved on one side, or uh, yeah, it Michael was was a pretty pretty much free kind of soul. If if you were good. And, uh, you know, you could hold your own. He, he was uh, he was great with you. But uh, I, I believe some of the confrontation might have been coming from Nick Rabinitis and Buddy. So yeah, that's that's really sad because that band could have just been a, a great driving force. So, so how long did you play with them, roughly? 
just throughout uh, 74 set and into 75. And then uh, we went with Buddy and recorded a uh, uh, couple. We Our first album with Buddy was called More Miles Per Gallon. And then the next one was Bison in 76 was Bicentennial Gathering of the Tribes. And uh, So you did uh, one album with Electric Flag and two with Buddy Miles as a solo? Yeah. It, it was kind of funny, though. The album with the Electric Flag, they used another horn group. They went down down south. I think they were in Florida and Michael Bloomfield wanted us to write out all the horn parts for all the songs. And that's really not the way we worked. Well, you know, we worked together a few times and okay, somebody has an idea. We'll take that. If it works, if it seems to fit. And we also thought our value would be higher if we didn't have everything written on paper. Well, you guys we are head, head musicians mostly just like us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it was, that's just how we worked. Yeah. You didn't need no stinking charts. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. <laughs> yeah. So yeah well, that's, well, what a great experience. Uh, did you tour with Buddy on his second two albums, like the other two solo albums? Did he go on tour with the other musicians or what? Oh, uh, no, we toured with Buddy throughout the... the but, but, in the early, but in the first album, you had Bloomfield and all those guys. For the other albums, you must have had other, other uh, musicians, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. He had a guy named Ben Schultz played guitar. Uh, and uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the other guys. Danny Martinez, a guy, keyboard player. Him and Buddy got into a fight one time on the, on the road. And you don't want to get into a fight with Buddy Miles. He'll do those paradiddles all over your head. You know, I mean, he's amazing. We used to call him the, heavy, the heavyweight champion of rock and roll. You know? Would he do paradiddles <laughs> with his fists? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Well, God. syncopation. <laughs> he he dude he did a song but uh, it's funny because i work both with, but this goes down the road but with, with uh, neil young and buddy miles and uh before we got together with neil and we're working with buddy he used to do a neil young song called down by the river oh i remember that yeah you know and uh, down by the river i shot my baby that i like that and neil when he wrote the song he wrote it it's kind of dedicated to danny Witten, who danny right. had od'd right. on uh, heroin and the idea of down, um, you know, sh I shot my baby. He, he, he meant shotting, shooting heroin. And Buddy, when he would do it, he would make you believe that he shot his baby down by the river with a machine gun. You know, you know doing the things with the snare drum. Uh, that just popped into my head when he said paradiddle. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been a great experience, but it's also kind of a little traumatic when there's that kind of toxicity in a band and guns and, and drugs, drugs yes. and guns. It's a little crazy. I, I fueled. Yeah, it's crazy. At least I'm, I'm glad to be alive, Mark. I really am these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of great experiences in there, too, but it was pretty uh, yeah. traumatic at the same time. So I think I know the story roughly how you wound up with Neil. The thing I've heard is that somebody's girlfriend, maybe it was Kenny's, I don't know, somebody and the horn section's girlfriend knew a, a woman who was a uh, secretary for neil young or for crazy oh, horse or what was that yeah what it, what it was was this girl uh, Lori talbert she was uh like kind of kenny's girlfriend on the side and Lori was also married to billy talbert and when billy would go out on the road then they kenny and Lori. uh i mean let's see yeah billy's still alive these days i hope he doesn't hear this but you know what the hell Billy uh, Talbert was the bass player for crazy horse crazy horse yes yeah. and so yeah. and, and as it turns out when Neil needed a horn section, or at, at first it was Crazy Horse needed a horn section for their album called Crazy Moon. And Lori, she told Billy, oh, I, I got the greatest horn section right here. We got together with Crazy Horse and recorded. And, uh, and there was some crazy, crazy things that, that happened during that session. And due to that, I think when Neil said he needed a horn section, Billy spoke up and said, Neil, I got a horn section that's just as crazy as you are. And he goes, oh, all right, well, let's give him a try. And then we went up and uh, up to a, the ranch and did uh, this notes for you. So so in other words, uh, you actually started with Crazy Horse and then through Crazy Horse, you got to Neil. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were a good group of guys. We had a lot of fun. And once again, guys. coincidentally, my longtime bass player, Rick Rosas, wound up playing bass with the uh, Neil Young, too, at the same time on the same album. Rick, Rick Rosas is the best, 
best bass player I've ever worked with. And you, you can't get any better on bass than Rick Russell, honestly. Hmm. So, you know, I don't know if you know the story, but when we started our band in 63, the Escorts, yeah. it was me, Ernie Hernandez, and Robert Warren, three guys. We didn't have a bass player. So I just told Richard, Rick, who was my friend, I said, hey, yeah. buy a bass and you can get in the band. So his parents bought him a St. George bass and amp. We got him going. We played together for 10 years. But that's how it started. I literally said to him, buy a bass and you can be in the band. That's he amazing. May, he may not have ever been a bass player. Yeah. Let alone play with Neil Young if that little thing hadn't happened, you know. But uh, yeah. Um, so that, um, and I think from what I heard, Steve Lawrence, uh, your sax player, is the one that recommended Rick, I believe, when Neil said, I need a bass player. So I mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's that, that what you just said about Rick, uh, that is an amazing thing. I didn't know that before. And that, that's yeah. some fantastic history right there. And you know, it's also amazing. I, I didn't even find out till maybe five years ago. I had another really, really good friend who lived right behind me in East LA on McDonald Avenue. And I offered him the spot before Richard. Imagine that. I said, you know, get a bass, you can get in the band. And I started to give him some guitar lessons and he just didn't have it. And he got frustrated. So I said, okay. So I asked Richard. So imagine that. If that guy had worked out too, it, Richard wouldn't have been in the band. Wow. But there, that wow. coincidence had to happen that that guy didn't yeah. work out. And mm -hmm. then that I offered it to Richard. And then, you know, he played with us for 10 years. He got a lot of recording experience with us because we recorded for Crescendo Records, uh, Cap Records, Capital Records, and mm -hmm. AM Records. So by the time he got that, you know, by the time he played with Joe Walsh, he had all that experience. So oh, he was ready. Gosh. He was ready. Yes. Yeah, really. Oh, we had the experience of, a couple of times to play with Joe. Uh, and uh, we did one time at the coach house. This was before Joe got clean and sober. Mm. Holy crap. Oh, <laughs> I've heard the stories. Yeah. Yeah. Fun times. <laughs> I can't go into much detail. <laughs> no, but we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. The other thing that helped Rick, we used to call him Richard, right? I mean, he was Richard. Right. He didn't become Rick till he played with Joe Walsh or much later. Mm. But um, he um, he learned, we learned a lot and he learned a lot from Tommy Coe. Tommy Coe oh. was big in our lives because, you know, we had made those earlier records, the Crescendo and the Cap records. But Tommy, after the Cap record thing didn't work out, we had two singles out, didn't get any promotion. Then he took us under his wing and he got us some studio time at this studio called Mark Studios. It was right next to Gold Star, right there on Vine and oh. Santa Monica, right across from SIR. I think SIR wasn't even there yet. But yeah. he got us time, like, uh, like on spec. He just said, hey, when the studio is not being used, can I bring these guys in? Yeah. So we'd go in and record at midnight. We'd record midnight to six. We'd record weird hours, but it was sure. incredible. You know, these we were about 19 years old and we were recording all night, driving home in the morning when people were going to work. We were smoking pot and going, driving home. Really? And, this is far out, man. You know, yeah. it was so cool feeling like, wow, this is too, this is really cool. So we would, we spent six months there recording an album of my songs. Wow. And uh, on spec, man, free studio time. Uh, mm -hmm. Tommy, Tommy gave us his time. You know, he he gave he believed in us, and he really it was like going to recording school because uh, he taught Richard and Ernie to lock in, bass yeah. drum and bass. He he taught them uh, all about dynamics and and uh, and uh, groove and and mm -hmm. time being on time playing in, in time. So yeah. that. They really got good right there with Tommy Coe. And we played, you know, recording almost every day for six months. And that was like recording college. So that served Richard well, too, because by the time he got to Joe Walsh and Neil, he knew to play simple. He knew to lock in with the bass drum. He knew to groove. You know, that's where it came from. Yes. Yeah, really. That was an invaluable experience, what you guys were able to do. There, even though, even though that the times that you had to do it in the studio was, you know, oh, it's, we, we loved it. We loved it. Yeah, yeah. We we kind of did that thing over at United Western uh, Recorders uh, uh, for a, uh, when it was downtime. We had a, a friend that would go in and, and he recorded a song called "Strange Situation," 
Uh, his name is Gordon Tryout. He went by the stage name of Mundane Willis and a great record that he did and we put together. But uh, I'm, so he, he made, we were going to get a record deal, but he made these demands of the record company. He said he wanted a band that would be about, oh, anywhere between 12 and 15 people. And they were freaking, wait a minute, you can't do that. Well, he was coming from the, the, the uh, Leon Russell days of uh, mm-hmm. Mad Dogs and Englishmen, Joe Cocker. All that he thought that that was the ultimate uh, thing, which is unfortunately we, we just missed the boat on that. Yeah, wow. Anyway. But it was funny you know, when we were recording at that studio, we, we got to meet Buck Owens. He came in, he was a friend of Tom. All right. And uh, Loggins and Messina were recording their first album, and Larry and Merle, their bass player drummer, would come in, and Michael Jackson, the Jackson Five, came in to record. Mm-hmm. You know? So we got to meet all kinds of people just from being there. And uh, Michael O'Marty and the great piano player that wanted to play oh, yeah. manager, he came in yeah. off the bus from wherever, Midwest. Hey, can we play on your record? Oh, no, you know, we're a self-contained band. We turned him down. <laughs> <laughs> all these beautiful new moves I made, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah it was the fun times, man. Yes. Right. But, um, so now you find yourself up there at Neil's Ranch and uh, rehearsing, and you became Neil Young and the Blue Notes. And that right. was the first time you really had a horn band. And it was, yeah. Richard, was Richard or Rick yeah. already with the band right from the get-go mm-hmm. when you started? Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a, a fantastic group. We we had to pick up uh, a couple more. Let's see, Kenny, Kenny wasn't doing it with us. Kenny uh, was doing something else. So we got uh, a guy named Claude Callier on uh, trombone, uh, and his good friend... Uh, John Fumo on trumpet. And then we had this guy, uh, Ben Keith, oh, who yeah. was Neil's pedal steel guitar player, who knew he could also play alto sax. Wow. And then uh, the uh, uh, Neil's uh, guitar tech, his name was uh, Larry, Larry Craig. Larry had played baritone sax. We had a six-piece horn section. Whoa. It was, it was like driving a massive Cadillac. I mean, this Woo. thing was so, so good. And, uh, and everybody managed to stay in tune pretty well. And it was it was quite a great experience. So you went up to the ranch and you just right away just started rehearsing these songs. And knowing mm-hmm. what I know about Neil, he's writing every day and he's writing as he goes. So he's probably yes. writing the songs and showing them mm-hmm. to you and you were recording them as you went. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we were I remember in the first about the first week or week and a half when he you know, he said, okay, he was going to do Neil Young and the Blue Nuts. And uh, I asked him, you know, it's funny because I, I felt I felt at ease enough to be able to just go up and ask him, you know, have uh, you ever heard of the the record label, the, the Blue Note Records? There's also a line of clubs called the Blue Notes uh, uh, Jazz Clubs, one in New York, there's one in Napa Valley. And so Neil said, well, as far as he was concerned, it was a traditional name. You could go ahead and use it. But down the road, we got sued. Uh, um, was it Harold Melville? Yeah, Melville yeah, yeah that, that's it. That was it. So we couldn't use that name anymore. So he changed it to Neil Young and Ten Men Working, which oh, just okay. didn't, didn't quite But the work. record still was out as the Blue Notes, right? And it's still out oh, today. Oh, yeah. That. Right. And he actually he re- he released a double CD uh, called Blue Note Cafe. This was back in 2015. He released it. And I think he had like 23 uh, songs, all live, the best live recordings that he did in 1988. And uh, he put it all together in a, a great, great uh, live uh, album. Wow. We got to tell the story. I'm glad I remembered this. How about the day that Neil Young came and played in East L.A.? Was yes, you... La Casita. Let's yes. talk about that. Right. We were during the day, we were doing a photo shoot at uh, for Rolling Stone in Hollywood. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the photographer, but that's not important. And uh, so after we were doing it and during the day, we were just getting along so great. Neil said, man, I really wish we could just go someplace and play right now. And naturally, Steve Otis Lawrence, he stood up. and said, I got the perfect place. It's in East L.A. Everybody's going to love it. And so we'll go down and do that. And so we took the whole 10 piece band down to Little La Casita, somehow we all fit, you know, where we were going to play. It was across the street from uh, like the golf course, right? We're across the street from what is now the Quiet Cannon. 
And yeah, then, JNS, the uh, great Mexican restaurant and, right there. Uh, I think I don't know. I don't know. There's a restaurant there called Ordonia's. I don't know if it's the same building, but it was right around there, right across the street. Uh, and yeah. it was a small restaurant club. Mm -hmm. Was it just a restaurant, or was it also a nightclub? Oh, it was. Uh, they it was a you know uh, uh, nightclub slash restaurant slash. Now everything. wasn't wasn't Steve's band or some related band was playing there at the time? Was Steve in the band that was playing there? Oh yeah, that's right. He was playing with Larry Cronin. Yeah, and Larry had his band there, and it was funny because uh, it, this was just a spur of the moment thing. So I I drive home, I pick up Diane, and we go down to La Casita, and then at that time, same time, Neil and everybody was showing up, and everybody was excited, but they didn't know why. And Diane, when she went into the the restroom, she said there was two girls in the restroom sitting there, and they go, you know, what's happening? What's happening right now? And the girl, one girl said, oh, I don't know, it's somebody named Neil Diamond or Neil Simon or somebody like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was good. But uh, I mean, that word started to spread, right? Once you guys got going, people started showing up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, and you guys were like crammed in, 10 guys crammed into a little corner? Uh, yes. And, and I remember Larry Corona, he almost got into a fight with our, our Larry, Larry, Larry uh, Bra Craig. Uh, well, I don't know what the, what the problem was, but it was, uh, you know, something maybe to do with the equipment, what was going on. But uh, um, I mean, and Larry, both Larrys, they were big, big dudes, I, you know. And Larry Cronin, for those who don't know, was uh, later in the group Yaki. You know, yeah. well, actually earlier was in the group Yaki in the 70s. I, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and his father owned a music store called the Cronin's, mm -hmm. uh, which was in what, Montebello? Yeah. Yeah, Beverly Boulevard. I, I got to be friends with Larry in uh, elementary school, Bella Vista Elementary School. We got to know each other. And then the fact that we ended up playing music, a lot of music together was just a gift from God. And it was wonderful. He, he was a great keyboard player. Yeah. Um, so what an amazing thing. Neil Young and the Blue Notes show up on, you know, unannounced at this little Mexican restaurant, nightclub in East LA. And and doing the whole album, right? You played the whole album? I think we did. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad nobody <laughs> videotaped it, right? People didn't have video phones or anything. No, no, I wish we had. God, that'd be amazing. And so uh, what, what happened was a great response from everybody. And yes. Was happy about it. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it was a a great a great event, and it was right after that 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 we went on tour. You know, we did uh, eighty eight, I believe it was, and uh, yeah, it was just amazing turn of events. The way that all all went down, and Neil he used to record everything, even sound checks, rehearsals, and all. And so when we were about to do the eighty eight tour, the summer tour, uh. We, I, I was talking to Steve about it, that we should uh, get our own contract together and tell them that anything that is released on any of your albums, you know, if yeah. you know, it, it goes to an album, that everybody in the band makes $500 just for, you know, they'd like it would be if it was studio time kind of thing. And when he came out with, uh, in 2015, came out with Little Cafe, it was uh, 20, what, 21, 22 songs, not counting introductions and stuff. And so I called Bonnie at Lookout Management. That was their, their people, their management company. And I said, hey, Bonnie, you know, we got this contract that says all the musicians should make X amount of dollars per song. And you just released like 21, 22 songs Ooh. here. So, and, and she says, she was like trying to call my blog. She said, well, if you could send me a copy of the contract that was signed, then uh, maybe we can expedite the process of getting you paid and all. And so Diane, my sweet lady Diane, she kept a copy of the contract in a shoebox in the closet, in her closet. And she broke it out. I sent it to Bonnie. A couple months later, we got, uh, you know, 10 grand. Each guy? Each yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, you guys also um, did some uh, some videos, right? Some cool videos. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, from that uh, album. That, this Notes yeah, For that. You. With Spuds mm -hmm. McKenzie and all that, yeah, yeah, that was uh, that one best video of the year. MTV's that's when MTV played videos, and uh, won the best video of the year, nineteen eighty eight, I believe. And at first, MTV banned Neil's video because they said he used the corporate sponsorship names. Ain't sing it for Pepsi. Ain't sing it for Coke. Don't sing for nobody. It makes me look like a joke. And uh, it 
it was ludicrous what they were saying. And so we were on the road, I think we were in Cleveland, Ohio, and MTV, they wanted to come down and do an interview with Neil. It was before the show. And so I happened to go down, you know, was, went down with him while he was doing the interview. And he tells the people of MTV, where they're all right there, you know, all excited and shit. And he said, you, you people don't give your viewers any credit at all for having any sense. He goes, they can tell that what I'm doing is a parody. I am, you know, full on putting it like that. It, you know, whereas Michelob, when they'll do their commercials for an artist or for uh, a concert, you know, the night belongs to Michelob. Uh, they're making money off that name. He goes, I'm not. You know, I, I'm, I'm telling it like it is. And right after that, MTV released our video on MTV and we won video of the year. So it's just having some uh, cojones yeah. pays off sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah. He's speaking of that uh, East L.A. thing, you said he recorded everything. Do you think he recorded that Mi Casita gig or La Casita gig? Oh, I, I doubt it very much. Wouldn't that be great take, to have that? Oh, that would be fantastic. But he would take the record plant mobile unit with him mm -hmm. when we were on, on the road. And I can imagine what that would cost to do mm -hmm. that. You'd take a full-on you know, recording studio with you. But he did it right. He did. Amazing. And uh, didn't you do a, a video on 10 men working as well? A 10 men yeah. working song? Yeah, yeah, we had that. Uh, the, it's funny, uh, I just remembered something that when we were recording uh, the This Notes for You album, we did it at SIR, the soundstage over on Melrose. And I found out just through experience that Neil doesn't usually give you uh, a second take. I you know, know I've heard. I've heard gone. it's crazy. It is because, I mean, we're doing a song called uh, Coop DeVille. He just wrote it that morning. He came to the studio. <laughs> he had it. And he goes, this song's going to be like nothing else we've ever done. You better just hang on and check it out. And it was a very quiet jazz kind of sound. I'm trying to figure out first what key he's in. So I got a harm and mute and a trumpet. I'm over in the corner and I'm going, er, er. OK, sounds like A, it's, you know, guitar player's favorite key. OK, besides E. And then he heard my my muted trumpet and he goes yeah yeah that's the sound that's the sound i want so when he goes into this one part you know it's a little change i gotta ride i go da, 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 in this crazy world ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, ba. kind of you know go with the chord progression and stuff and it was exactly what he wanted in the first take and i mean i was ready to do another one i what i wanted to do is get closer on the mic to give it more of a miles davis uh muted trumpet sound but he said no that's it and I went, wow, yeah. that was easy. I've heard so many stories and, and I, from Rick himself that yeah. you know, sometimes and he'll come in and show you a song and you just have that one time to learn it and to do it. And that's it. You yeah. know? And it happened uh, several times. And you got to be ready to just get into it. The only other guy that does it is Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan has been doing that for years. You can just one take, two takes. There you go. You just yeah, jump in right. and do it and mistakes are okay. I think mm -hmm. there was one time when Richard uh, made a mistake and he told Neil, well, can I fix that note? And Neil says, yeah, you can fix it, but I'm not going to use it. <laughs> I'm still going to use the first. <laughs> it's, like there's a, it's like there's a shelf life on this music or something. Yeah, yeah like, exactly. Hey. They want yeah. that spontaneity and they want you to be like freaked That's out up on your toes. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any other Neil stories uh, from the road or anything? Oh, yeah. Just about a month ago, he released this album called Toast. And we recorded the album in uh, November of 2020, of 2001, uh, of 2001. And so, I mean, it's, what is it? It's 20 some odd, 21 years old. And he decided to release it right this last month. And so it's called Toast. I, I found out over the, you know, a good friend on Facebook. I have a lot of friends on Facebook who are big Neil Young fans and they want to, you know, see what, you know, what stories I might have or whatever. And this one girl, she said, hey, I loved your trumpet on this song called Boom, Boom, Boom off of the Toast album. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And she sent me the, you know, the hookup on it. And yeah, that was me playing. Uh, but it was. Were, uh, were Steve and Kenny on that album too? No, no, he just used the, the muted trumpet on oh, that. I, I think he, he liked the muted trumpet that, that came out on Coupe de Ville, so he kept me in mind for other things. And that. Uh, so you just played on the one song on that album? Yeah, 
Yeah, just the one thing. And then after that, he never, since he never released that album in 2002, he recorded a, an album called Are You Passionate with uh, Booker T and uh, Duck, Duck Gun. Dunk. Yeah. Steve and so, right. Yeah, they were all there. And he wanted me, he flew me up to San Francisco to, to do it. And it was the same song, only it was a different name. And the song is called She's a Healer. And that's why I couldn't put when the one girl said, you know, you played on the song, boom, boom, boom. Never, I've never heard the that title before. But uh, who am I to judge? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and of course, in uh, 2004, you get a call to play on the Living With War album. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> Did you yeah. forget that one? Mm -hmm. uh, wow. It's, so it's once again, one. Rick Rosas yeah. was on that as well. And once yeah. again, he took you guys in, recorded the whole album in a matter of a couple of days or something. It was a, about a, a week, a week and a half that we recorded all of the, the music for the album. And then they went down to Capitol Records and uh, did all the vocals with a, a choir of uh, about 100 people in the choir. And uh, when I first got the call to do the thing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living in Las Vegas at the time. So I'm jumping on a plane and I called Bonnie over at Lookout and I said, Bonnie, what, is there going to be a, a more horn players on this thing? Because I'm used to working with horn players. And she said, no, it's just going to be the trumpet. And I said, really? She goes, yeah, it's like a power trio with a trumpet. I go, <laughs> wow. Well, I've never done that before. But I asked Neil about it. And he said, yeah, you're like the bugler from the battlefield. That's right. You did a lot of like taps before. and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So that record that album was written and recorded pretty quickly, and it yeah. was an anti-war album, and that's what it was all about. It was absolutely totally anti-war and impeaching yeah. the president and all that stuff. Oh, I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> you can dance to it, impeach the president. Yeah, uh, but um, but you guys went on tour with CSN and Y uh, mm -hmm. in two thousand four, and Rick Rosas was on bass. Uh, maybe 2000, 2006 was the oh yeah 2006 that's correct yeah and i went uh rick invited me down and it was at the place what used to be irvine meadows now it has a different oh, yeah name. yeah i was in the audience there and uh saw the show and uh, uh saw you up there and, and rick it's uh, very cool mm -hmm. i went backstage afterwards but i didn't see you i don't know where you were but uh oh, oh if that was irvine yeah yeah i had my my daughter amy and a couple of her friends so we were probably off someplace else but uh yeah, yeah. I, those were incredible days man so just uh with with crosby sills nash with neil oh, uh man. it was an amazing experience uh i wish those guys could get along together i mean that's the last time they all played together you know yeah. in, in recording or touring yeah so it's kind of a kind of a short tour was that was it kind of short or was that it was uh we started rehearsing in june of 60 or uh, excuse me 2006 and we finished in the latter part of se September 11th. Excuse me, it was when the tour was done. And, uh, and uh, that DVD came out on it, on that tour. Right. And if I just could just say, I think he made a mistake in, when he, he called the DVD... Uh, Deja Vu uh, or something like that? Deja Vu. I mean, why didn't he call it Freedom of Speech? Because that's what it was. That's what everybody could relate to. And Deja Vu, they released an album in 19... Yeah, I believe right. it was Maybe yeah, a little confusion. But that was a yeah. real controversial tour because so many people walked out, you know, the right-wingers, and uh, yeah. they were, you know, they were walking out in droves and, you know, mm -hmm. cussing. And, but Neil didn't yeah. care, which is... Uh, that's Neil, you know, he's just totally resolute in what he believes in and didn't yeah. care. Yeah, they, they had Half the people were pissed off. Yes, we, we had what we call... When we were on that, we were down in Atlanta, Georgia. And after we finished the uh, show, the roadies came up. As we're still on stage, he get, they come up and they say, okay, we're doing a quick out. And a quick out is you grab your instrument and you run to the bus. And you get in the bus and you got a police escort. And because they really thought that there were people out there that really wanted to hurt uh, all of us musicians here. So yeah. anyway. Pretty crazy. ballsy thing to do. Ballsy thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what was that like? What were... Uh... Stills, Nash and Young, like were they pretty cool with you? Oh uh, yeah, let's see. We had uh, Stephen Stills, who was really hard to work with in the beginning, um, and uh, he, like me now, I mean, he has he had a really bad hearing problem, and uh, he would get frustrated and and yell and and do things that were just not <laughs> not polite, shall I say? Uh, he would criticize other people's playing. 
And one guy who put him in line, though, was Ben Keith. Ben, it was a super fellow, and, and he would go over to, to Stephen. Uh, Stephen kept trying to count one of his songs off, a song that I uh, can't, can't think of the name of it right now. But on stage, he would try to count it off, and he would get it wrong. Uh, Stephen Stills would get the, the meter wrong on the song that he wrote every time. And Ben would just went over to him one day at rehearsal, and he said, let Chad count that off. Chad, super pro drummer. Rick and Chad worked together all the time. And, and after that point, then Stephen just stopped and let Chad, you know, count the song off the way it should be. But there weren't many people that could tell Stephen anything. But Ben Keith was one. And yeah. uh, David Crosby was, I thought, kind of a, let's say outspoken. A, a lot of things would be better if he hadn't spoken up, you know, to speak up about things. And uh, David, or uh, uh, Graham Nash was the nicest guy of all four of them. Yeah. yeah, I heard stuff about Stephen. You know, Stephen's one of my all-time favorite singer-songwriters. You know, love Buffalo Springfield, love his voice, uh, Manassas. You know, CSN. Yeah, right. Great, great. One of my favorites. But I've heard nothing but nightmarish stories about him. Uh, you know, one thing that Rick learned was don't speak to Stephen unless he speaks to you. Don't even look at him. You know, because you don't know if he's going to be in a good mood or a bad. That's mood. that's really good advice that Rick said right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> God, no. But great it, it, got, man. it got funny traveling too because on the road we had the band bus, which and if anybody ever needed a ride or anything, they uh, jumped on the band bus. But you got the major players, you know, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. They all have their own buses, right? So it was quite a caravan or convoy, I should say, that we had going down the road. It was, I saw those buses, and yeah. Uh, yeah, when I went backstage, of course, all the stars went to their respective buses right away. But backstage was a Spooner Oldham keyboard player and uh, uh, some uh, Ben Keith and some of those guys were hanging out. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Photographer, I think Henry Diltz was there, maybe. Mm -hmm. Photographer. Yeah. So I met a few people. It was pretty cool. Yeah, and those buses, man, luxury buses. Yeah. Four of them. Uh, that must have been a trip. So, um, so what did you? What have you been doing since uh, since that uh, since that tour, two thousand six? Oh, just uh, well. First, I'm I was really thrilled that that Neil released that Toast album because it just, you know, it brought back some great memories. He had his wife uh, Peggy, who's passed from cancer. Uh, uh, she sang on it, and his sister, uh, I forget her name, Andred or something. I can't think of her name, but they're beautiful people. Uh, so that brought back good memories. And living in Temecula, we have a lot of music going on every weekend here. Uh, got a lot of good friends. And I am actually I actually booked a solo gig for uh, October. I use backing tracks for a rhythm section. Then I add my piano, trumpet, and flugelhorn. And just, uh, mm -hmm. it's quite an adventure. So, so you were living in Las Vegas when you got the call for the, uh, was it Living With War or was it for the? For the yeah. Yeah, that was the one. So when did you move from Vegas to Temecula? It wasn't that long ago, was it? Like how many? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's see. We moved from Southern California to Las Vegas in 1999, and then we were in Las Vegas until 2019. Wow. Oh no, excuse me. I'm sorry. That's right. We were there in, until 2009. We sold our house in Las Vegas in 2009 and found a, a nice little house here in Temecula. When you were in Vegas, were you playing some of the Vegas places, or were you yeah, I would know. You know, there's something you learn as a musician. If every once in a while you got to go out and get a real job, yeah. So I did that. Uh, I, I managed the produce department for a company called Kroger for a good length of time, and and then a couple of Albertsons, and it's uh, it's something that teaches you uh, the, the responsibilities and just how to make money in a produce produce department can be a a challenge. So uh, I was able to do that. Good job. It's probably, uh, was it as hard as working with Stephen Stills, working in a produce department? It was a wonderful experience, uh, uh, except for Stephen Stills. That wasn't a wonderful I, I experience. I think Stephen Stills, so he's harder to get along with, with pr than produce. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I got a watermelon. I'll split it with you. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, so uh, what about, I want to ask you about uh, turning back the clock. Uh, Hank talked about uh, when you guys... Uh, Backed up Chuck Berry. We're on a concert with Chuck Berry. Yes. Do you remember that? 
Yes, I think it was uh, Santa Barbara. Maybe. One time in Santa Barbara. And, um, and, he, and, and uh, at the time on New Year's when he walked off the stage? Yes. Talk yes. about that experience. Talk about yeah, the whole experience we, of backing him. Yeah, we were just uh, starting the set with Chuck Berry. And all the people got up and they started dancing. Well, this is a theater kind of place. And all of the, you know, the, the ushers, the bouncers, they come up and they told everybody to sit down. And Chuck Berry got on the mic and he said, no, you they, let him dance. And they said, no, we can't let him dance. It's a, you know, city ordinance or some kind of thing. And he just picked up his, you know, I'm, I'm sure he'd already been paid. Yes. So he grabbed his guitar and took off. And we had the last two and a half hours before New Year's to try and make it happen. But, you know, we had Manny Esparza, thank you very much. And he killed it. He did it. Yes, let's give a shout out to Manny Esparza, great kick-ass R&B singer. Yeah. You guys had a great horn section. Uh, mm -hmm. The whole band, you guys were like, I said, you guys grew up together organically. You rehearsed a lot. You were tight. And you all got great together. And, uh, and it all came to fruition on that Elijah album, I'm telling you. Yeah. I recommend anybody if you can find that album, United Artists, Elijah, 1972. You'll see what I'm talking about. But then you yeah. guys all went on to do great things with other artists, and it's kind of a very cool story. Yeah. Yes. And here we are. You know? Yes, indeed. And I want to thank you, my friend, for bringing me in to you know your podcast thing. It's it's a it is a wonderful thing. I'm glad you're documenting all of uh, our crazy stories of all of us musicians who. At one time, I did, man. I used to be somebody, you know what I mean? But hey, we're, it's we're, it's a thrill. We're really. still somebody, baby. And we're probably yeah. better than ever in terms of his musicians, if you just put us on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We got all this experience. You replace Yeah. Well, good, man. Well, thanks for doing the show, man. Appreciate it. And uh, look forward to running into you somewhere, you know? Yes, okay. yes. I am looking forward to seeing this. And uh, I'm glad you have the ability to edit. That's a wonderful thing. Oh, oh I'm going to edit this shit out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, Mel, thanks for doing it, and I'll talk to you next time. All right. Thank you, Mark. All right.